Okay, in this video we're going to talk about the direction that you move your router in order to get the best out of the machine and the best results on your workpiece. So stick around for everything you need to know, don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment down below if you've got any questions. So there is a lot of confusion and misconceptions out there that I've come across um, over the years about which way to move the router around the work um, and, and I get that there are confusions about that because I guess we're used to having machines like a table saw or a circular saw where the blade is moving in a particular direction and all of a sudden we turn that on its side and then we can move in either direction it gets a little bit more um, confusing as to which is the best. Now there are probably things that you've heard push or pull um, or left and right or clockwise and anti-clockwise and it depends on how your brain works as to which is the, the most appropriate. Whatever router you've got, whether it's a plunge router, a fixed base router, um, it, it, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what the make is or what the model is, it, it all works exactly the same. There's one thing that is common throughout all routers across the world, they rotate the cutter clockwise when you've got the router in your hand to work. And it doesn't matter whether the router's this way round or that way round or halfway round, whatever orientation of the machine, the cutter is still moving in a clockwise direction. Now, some people have argued that point in the past, but let me show you the cutters and I'll explain why that is a fact and not a misconception or a myth. Okay, so here's my router cutter. If I balance it on the work, like that, as if it's in a machine, hopefully you can see the teeth are all pointing in the same direction. If I rotate that clockwise, the teeth are cutting. Now, if I rotate it the other way, it's not going to work. And if you've ever managed to put a table saw blade or a circular saw blade in the machine the wrong way round, you'll see it doesn't cut very well at all. Um, now, something that everyone probably is aware of is we always cut against the direction or the rotation of the cutting implement. So if it's spinning clockwise, we need to cut that way. And the easiest way to demonstrate this is using uh, an edge molding bit, which I've got set up in the machine already. I've set it to the right depth. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna route the edges of this piece of work and I'm going to move the machine in an anti-clockwise direction around the outside. And this is why I prefer to think of clockwise and anti-clockwise because it doesn't matter the orientation of the piece of work on whatever it is I'm machining. Um, it doesn't matter where I am, where I start and where I finish, I can always go anti-clockwise. So here, from your perspective, I'm working left to right, that's my right to your left, and along here, I'm working my left to your right, your right to my left, no, my left to my right, your right to your left, but it's still the same anti-clockwise direction. But when we get to the sides, I can be going up and down, up or down, yeah? but it's still anti-clockwise. Now, if this was the, I don't know, let's say I wasn't doing all of these, I was just machining the, the front edge of a shelf or something. Just the one edge, I can work anti-clockwise, start here, route that way. Or I could start here and route that way, and it's still in an anti-clockwise direction around the piece of work, yeah? And that's the key to remember. So I can stand here and I can pull it, I can stand here and I can push it, I can stand here and pull it, or I can go from side to side. It really doesn't matter as long as it is in an anti-clockwise direction. Simple. Now because I'm working on solid wood, this is a piece of pine, so um, there's actually no requirement health-wise for me to wear a mask, and I won't, so I can still talk to the camera, um, because pine produces what's referred to as nuisance dust, and next time I blow my nose, all the, uh, the nuisance dust that will be accumulated in the air um, will get removed and placed in the hanky, and then that can go in the bin. Um, if I'm routing MDF, 
or hardwoods or um, some exotic stuff, then the, the dust produced can be toxic and um, then a mask is required. But for this piece of work, a bit of old softwood pine, um, there's no requirement. Okay, obviously there is still a requirement for some safety glasses. Now, because this is solid wood and it has a grain direction, um, or it could be a piece of plywood with the veneers on the face being in, in that direction, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start routing on the end grain. Doesn't matter which, I can start on this bit end grain or this end grain, it doesn't really matter because in the end, I'm gonna go and do all of them. Um, but there is a chance, just like when we um, we use a, a miter saw or a chop saw or even a circular saw, as the, the cutter's cutting, it's gonna have a tendency to want to chip these end fibers. Now, if I do those last, and I've already machined this, if it chips, then it's gonna chip out on my finished edge. But if I do it first, and then come across and machine this profile here, there's a much better chance that any breakout on this corner and this corner will be absorbed by the following machining process. So hopefully that'll happen. Let me show you. Okay, so I've machined the first edge and hopefully you can see there, it's chipped. But that doesn't matter because, let's keep it in the same plane. I'm now gonna come across and route that profile anyway. So hopefully you can see that that tear out that originally happened has now been absorbed by the follow-up profile and that's now nice and clean. So a little bit of burning, burning occurred at the start and finish of the line. That's not to do with the, the cutter, that's purely my feed rate. As I start on the edge, I'm going more slowly, it's building up friction. And then as I'm approaching the end, it's built up a bit there, but as you can see on the end, I've kept it nice and clean. And that's to do with my um, feed rate, the speed at which I'm moving the machine. But we'll go into those um, in another video. Let's say for example, I needed to just profile one edge and I didn't want any tear out. What I can do is with another piece of um, material, a bit of scrap that's the same thickness as what I'm working on, I can put that across there and then where I start, I can route this. This will burn, my feed rate's up to speed. I can route along the edge, and then my spare piece on the edge, or sacrificial piece, or splelch block, whatever you want to call it, um, will basically support these end fibers and stop that from tearing out on the end there. So there we go, a nice clean profile. Yeah, a little bit of burning on there. The outside edge, anti-clockwise. As the cutter's going round, it's breaking out the, uh, the material. Right, what about with a straight cutter? Okay, so what I've got here is a straight flute Two flute cutter, uh, it's 10 millimeters in diameter um, on a quarter inch shank installed into the router and I've added a side fence. Now, dependent on essentially how much you spend on your router, will depend on the complexity and how many bells and whistles your fence has. This has got a fancy fine adjuster to fine tune it's setting left and right in it, and it's also got these adjustable side tubes. Um, 
but I've deliberately left those open because if your router fence has a less expensive, fewer bells and whistles, you're more than likely just got a large aperture. And the reason for that large aperture is we can put a larger cutter in there, but only use a proportion of or part of its diameter to routes. So if we want to do a rebate that's six mil wide and we're using a one inch diameter cutter, we can just use the edge of it. That's the reason for that. Um, so I've deliberately left that open. Now where previously we had our bearing, which was riding along the edge of our work and giving us our, essentially our depth of cut in from the edge. We don't have that on this standard two flute cutter. So we need something to basically stop us from wandering too far away from our cut line and keep it in the right place. So this we're gonna use is the fence. But the fence is still referencing off the edge of the work. So the same rule applies. We go anti-clockwise around the outside of the work. Don't forget the cutter is still cutting in a clockwise direction, exactly the same as it was before. So the same applies. I keep putting my specs down and forgetting where I put them. Now, one thing to remember, or to consider, should I say, is if we're routing an edge and we move the router away from the work, all that's going to happen is we're not going to cut as much material, but that's fine because there's nothing on the other side. So we can just go over that again and reroute it. So the bearings in contact or the fence is in contact and that's going to keep it in a straight line and that's fine. So let's route this OG profile on this end into a, a rebate say. So it could be a rebate in the bottom of a drawer or perhaps the back of a cabinet say. Now because this has got an open end, there's potential for the router to swing in like this and cut essentially a corner off here and then follow on and then there's potential for it to do exactly the same on the outside. So what, we, what we're going to do to get around this is we're going to keep more pressure on the front fence as we come into the work and effectively drag the rear side of the fence in with us. And then once we're through, we're gonna bias the back so the front then carries on in a straight line. Effectively the same as we would with a planer or a jointer, depending on um, where you're from. And hopefully we'll get a continuous straight line and we won't cut in on the corner. Let's see how we get on with that. One straight line, if we get a ruler, square, we should see that we've got a nice straight line on our outfeed side, because we were that way, and then on our infeed side, we've got that. So what I'm gonna do now is exactly the same again but I'm gonna change position and I'm gonna pull in this direction. But this time I'm gonna deliberately allow that fence to fall in on the in feed and a little bit on the out feed as well, just to show you what happens. This is deliberately done. So hopefully you saw what happened there. And if I put that ruler on then, can you see that gap? I've got a gap in here. In there. And then there's slightly more extreme across there. And if I draw that, maybe if I colour that in, you'll be able to see it more clearly. Hopefully you can see there where it 
tucks in and tucks in. So that's something to consider um, when you're using a side fence. Right, the way around that is if you've got one of these more, more bell and whistly fences. Now I always consider these, well they virtually meet up on this one, um, I always consider these to effectively be sacrificial because they're really easy to make actually out of piece of ply. Um, but if you're doing a rebate as we are here and not using the full width of the cutter then it's a good idea just to back them up a little bit to just allow for the, um, the cutter space um, to give you the least amount of aperture to potentially fall into. If you don't have these fancy cheeks, then what you can do is just screw on a piece of uh, a batten that's straight, and close that off so you've got a full straight edge to ride on. That's, that's the make do method. Right, so as well as doing the a rebate with a straight cutter, we could also do a groove, so a slightly more substantial method to let a, the base into a drawer or the back into a cabinet, give it even more strength, um, was to actually put it into a groove. And we can still use our straight cutter for that. And all we need to do is adjust how far the fence is away from the cutter, exactly the same as you've probably seen with a router table fence, if you've got a split fence on a router table. So all I'm gonna do is exactly the same thing again only this time I'm going to route a groove or a dado or a trench or whatever you want to call it. So there we have a nice straight channel that runs parallel to the edge of the wood. Nice and simple. And we could just keep doing that if we want to put multiple slots in. Um, however we want to do it. Now there is a disadvantage with the fence in that it has a finite distance that it can run governed by the rods. Now this has got screw threads on the end so I can actually put extra rods to make them even longer. But the problem that that creates is if I'm right up the end here or even further over it becomes more difficult because it's a, a moment acting on this fence, more likely for it to, to swing. Now when we cut the rebate and when we did the profile, it wasn't really that important. If the fence came away from the, the work, we can just go back and recut it and that's no problem. If we're cutting a groove, we want a straight line on both sides of the, um, the channel and if we let the fence move away from the work then what happens is we're going to end up with too much material on one side and a cutout on the other so when we put anything in there we get a gap and we don't want that and this is why direction is important what I'm going to do now is I'm going to swap to the I'll stick on this side I'll swap to this side and I'll show you what happens or what can happen when you route clockwise. Now this isn't a dangerous cut um, because we're working on both sides of the cutter, but if it was a rebate then it potentially could be dangerous um, in terms of as that cutter's spinning round, it's gripping into the wood and it wants to then pick up momentum and drag you along in the work or accelerate towards you. But for this it has a more practical application so now 
hopefully you saw what, what happened there. I wasn't putting an awful lot of side pressure on the machine there, and that's why it's quite an extreme change. But hopefully you can see what's happened there. You see it's wandered out, and that is to do with the direction of the cutter, the way it's rotating. As the cutter is spinning, it has this natural inertia that makes it want to disappear off in that direction. So unless we're forcing it into the side with the fence, that's going to want to do that. And it's something else we can think about. Now, when we're coming the other way, it has the same tendency, but it wants to wander into the work, effectively pulling the fence tighter against the edge of the work. So if you've been routing with a side fence and sometimes you get a nice straight cut and then the next time you do it, you get a wandering cut, that probably is what's happening. Um, unless you are forcing the router to disappear off, um, you've got one direction, anti-clockwise, the, the right way to do it, or the correct way to do it, should I say, is working with you. If we go the other way, then it's actually working against you, so you've got something else to contend with. So if your router experience has given you that effect in the past, that's probably what it is. Outside the work, go anti-clockwise. Now let's say I want to put a trench down here, which is outside the scope. Well, it could be the fact that I can go from the other side and I've still got the reach, but it might not be. So we need some other way to guide our cutter, because this could be the side of a bookcase. It could be, you know, eight feet long, and our fence just won't reach that far. And even if we got long enough rods, we've still got that moment effect that I talked about before, trying to keep the fence straight and aligned. So what we can do is we can use a secondary guide, and this could be literally anything. So, what have I got the kicking around? I've got, um, as long as this edge is straight, I can clamp that down on the work and I can use that as a straight edge to guide the machine. It doesn't have to be solid wood, it could be a piece of MDF. As long as it's a straight edge, we can use that. It could be a spirit level. Okay, so just to prove the point that you can literally use anything, what I've got here is an off cut of MDF skirting board or baseboard depending on where you're from and I'm just going to clamp this on I'm going to route using the base of the router against the edge of this straight edge to give me my straight line and now I'm obviously I'm working on the inside of the piece of timber now I said when you're working on the outside you go anti-clockwise. Conversely, actually, if you're working on the inside for an aperture, you go clockwise. But we're really not concerned about this piece of um, our actual finished bit of work. What we're concerned about now is our guide. And we're going around the outside of our guide. This is our reference point now. Originally, with the bearing, the outside of our work was our reference point. And with our fence, the outside of our work was the reference point. Now we're working against the outside edge of this, which is our reference point, our, you know, our datum for where we cut from. So we're going to go outside around the outside of this. Yeah? The same thing, the same rule applies. Anti-clockwise, I'm going to start here and route up away from me. There we go. Nice straight edge nice straight um, trench or groove, no problem whatsoever. Now you can see there is a gap between the edge of our guide that we're using and where we actually cut. Yeah? So I refer to this as my offset. Yeah? And that will change dependent on the diameter of our cutter we put this where we wanted our cut, 
and I've done it loads of times before, um, instead of a cut where we want it, we'll end up with a cut next to it and that can be annoying. So what I actually do with my router, hopefully you can see that, um, this is one of the most common cutters I use, it's 18mm diameter. Um, I actually write on there what the offset is and I don't need to remember it, um, I just know that if I've got my 18mm trench going in here, I need to move my guide 66mm across to one side. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use this, this is a slightly fancier, more bells, more whistles um, guide. It just clamps in on the work and I can move it as I need. I'll cover that over. Tighten that down and that's now strong enough to hold it without it flopping around. So notice how I used the flat edge of my router base against there. Now, the reason that I would do that on occasions is I've got one of the columns always on the base. The front one on the infeed, then both, and then the back one. And I can stop the router from tipping and effectively making a ramp out and a ramp in on my cut. But what I can actually do is use the curved edge of my base as well. Now, this isn't true for every single router. If you have a router, um, DeWalt do one, where the, and Bosch do one, where the main motor is, and Trend do one as well, um, where the, the router body and the motor and the collet assembly and everything like that can be detached from the base to separate them, there's chance that they don't always go back exactly in the same place. If your router is completely fixed all in one, then this curve will be a true radius from the center point. Therefore, from that center point to this point of this radius is exactly the same distance as anywhere along that arc. Yeah, and I'll prove that. So that's still perfectly straight line. No dramas there. Conversely, if I use the flat edge, I get this kind of wavy pattern. So one's a wavy pattern. And one's a, a straight pattern. Yeah. And obviously I didn't, you saw me not move the guide, you also obviously get two different offsets as well. Both have their advantages, both have their disadvantages, because obviously if I'm working on the round edge, potentially I could have my columns out. The way I get around that is I just have the column just on the edge, on this edge of the, um, the arc, and then I can rotate in and along and then rotate out but always going anti-clockwise around the outside of whatever it is I'm referencing against. So if I'm cutting on this side of the guide, I go up just like I did. If I'm working on this side, I'm gonna come down. Yeah, And that's why I don't like the left or right um, rule because it can be confusing. You have to think about the setup to go left and right. And if you get something set up differently, um, or something orientated differently, then that left and right goes out the window. So let me show you now an application where you might want to work an aperture. Um, I don't know, let's say this was a office desk um, or a, a television unit and we wanted to make some holes for cable access. Aside from just drilling a hole, or using a jigsaw, um, we can use the router for that as well, with the aid of something to guide us. Now, as I've already said, if we're working around the outside of something, we go anti-clockwise, yeah? So there's one thing. There's four things that we're gonna work around anti-clockwise. If I now set these up anti-clockwise,
that now becomes a clockwise direction on the inside of that. Yeah, and it doesn't matter what what the shape is. Um, it could be an oval, and we're going to go around the the inside of it. It could be a square or a circle, or even some kind of combination of curves and straights. We're going to go around the outside along the inside of an aperture. Yeah. Now for this, doesn't matter what the size is, inside clockwise. Right. Now I fitted a guide bush to the the router, but if I was using a bearing guided cutter where the bearing was on the top, I could rotate run the bearing of that around the inside of this aperture or shape or whatever it was. I'm just going to use the, the guide bush. Now when we've got clamps on here, we uh, need to make sure that they're not going to be in the way, which they're not. So if you're making templates to use, they need to clamp on, they need to be bigger than um, probably what you initially think they are. If this is a hole and everything inside here is being removed, and it doesn't really matter so much if I wander away from the the template because everything's going to be removed if this was a let's say it was a, a v-bit cutter or something decorative then it would matter we've really got to stay in contact with the um, with the template otherwise we're going to be in the same situation as when we were cutting our straight line grooves if we wander off it'll be seen on both sides um, so if something for decorative it's important to keep with the template and that is why we go anti-clockwise to stop that wandering effect, keep it in track and make sure that everything stays safe and also that the cut is cutting efficiently in the way you would cut. Remember that saw blades installed backwards, they don't cut very well. we've got our, our shape. Obviously if it was going to be an all the way through hole then we just keep plunging down, plunging down, working our way around, taking it out, doodle it and effectively yeah, cutting through the depth of it. Nice and easy. That can be any shape, it can be any um, any shape at all um, and we could effectively have any shape of cutter in there as well. Um, something more decorative or an actual physical shape. Now I know it's people, people are going to ask this because I, I get asked this every single time I talk about templates and direction. Um, this, this is just a circle or a square or whatever, it's something nice and simple. If it is a more complicated shape, so let's say you had to cut out, I don't know, 200 hearts. Yeah. If you wanted to keep 200 heart shaped pieces of material I would make the template the heart shape slightly smaller and use that to guide to cut out the shape if I wanted a 200 heart shaped holes in something then I would make the template the outside because that will protect the work that we're keeping because we've got the heart-shaped hole if we want the heart shape piece of work you know or the whatever shape piece of work I would make the template smaller but a circle so or a heart um, and obviously if you make it the aperture clockwise around if you're making it the heart shape that you're then going to put over the top to protect the bit that you want to keep you go anti-clockwise around the outside of it. Really that simple. Anti-clockwise on the outside, clockwise on the inside of whatever it is you're referencing against. The edge of the work, the edge of the template, whether it's the outside edge of the template, the inside edge of the template, or a straight guide, or the edge of the work with the fence doesn't matter, it's still, still the same principle. That will keep the cutter running efficiently. 
So hopefully that gives you an understanding and the confidence to either work out why things were going wrong for you in the past or how to do it right with just learning. Any questions or comments, leave them down below. I do answer all comments. If you've got a question, get in touch. We can address it um, if need be. Don't forget to like and subscribe. There will be more videos coming out about other practicing techniques for, uh, for routing because that's what this channel is primarily about. So uh, stay tuned for the next set of videos and click the subscribe button um, with the little bell icon and then you'll get notified of all those new um, videos coming out. And there is quite a large back catalogue, um, probably getting on for nearly three figures now, of purely routing videos, tips, tricks, modifications, ideas, cheats, the whole um, nine yards. So uh, we'll see you back here again next time.